Health, psychology, and human nature with Andre Stureson. Hey friends, hope you're having a great day. Are you following me on Instagram and Facebook? Please go to Health, Psychology and Human Nature on Instagram or Facebook or both for that matter to get the latest episodes, inspiration and more. Please take a pause and go there. Also, if you like the episode, please share it with a friend, family member or somebody else who you think might like it. Welcome back, friends, to Health, Psychology and Human Nature with me, André Stureson. A science-focused podcast where we explore, learn and improve our lives together. Can we live longer due to a healthy microbiome? In today's episode, I speak with Dario Valenzano about this. And Dario, he has done some fascinating work when it comes to fish and how they age due to their microbiome. How much longer they live and why? Well, you will get the answers in today's episode. Dario Valenzano, he's a group leader at the Max Planck Institute. He has interest in aging, the microbiome, evolution and a lot more. He has a PhD in neuroscience and have worked at Stanford before starting his work at the Max Planck Institute. Friends, I really hope you enjoy this interesting episode. Dario, welcome to the show. Oh, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. It's a real honor having you on. I'm really excited to talk to you today about some fascinating stuff. So thank you for coming on. For sure. Um, All right. I I think that perhaps we should get into uh, your interest because you're really into aging, microbiome, evolution. Um, Why are you interested in all this stuff? Well, I think aging, um, it's one of the most debated and uh, complicated uh, fields uh, of biomedical science. Um, It pulls in itself a lot of different uh, fields. So when I think about aging, I really think about biology uh, times time. By that, I mean that uh, aging really has to do with uh, what happens in a living organism over time. And it's not necessarily restricted to what happens later on in life, but it's really like the concept of age, of change, of, you know, uh, over time. So... um, Rather than looking at a function, a structure, uh, a community at a you know steady state, you actually look at what happens uh, dynamically. So uh, has to do with uh, equilibrium, trying to tip the balance away from equilibrium, and how these systems, these biological systems, in this specific respect, go back to uh, to normal, to to uh, to balance. So I think it's a particularly fascinating concept and. Um, uh, it uh, reach, reaches out to a uh, basic molecular way of uh, lo- looking at uh, biological systems. So it, you know, it provides questions, open questions and ground for investigation to uh, different, uh, uh, different investigators. Those are more into individual molecules. You can ask what molecules may affect aging. Uh, the researchers who are more into um, uh, interventions that have nothing with, you know, have to do nothing with uh, 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 with drugs, for example, but with genetic manipulation. So you can ask what genes affect the aging process, uh, and you can ask different types of questions. For example, why different organisms and how different organisms age differently. So in a way, aging, the way I see it, is as almost as broad as biology. So I think uh, uh, it's uh, in a way for a biologist. For a biologist, it's easy to to be to be curious and to be intrigued by this by this open question. Interesting, yeah. So there's a lot of different things that you can study when it comes to aging, and it's also a field that is moving moving forward quite a lot right now. Or yeah, I mean, he, he, he got like a big boost over the past few uh, decades, I would say. So uh, since uh, I guess we. Uh, discovered uh, as a field that uh, you can 
intervene genetically or pharmacologically, and you can even extend lifespan and slow down the aging process in uh, experimental model organisms. Yeah, that's that's super interesting. Perhaps we could talk a little bit about that. Um, so so let's say that if we talk about us as humans, I know that that there's a lot of experiments on, on animals, but as humans, like what are the most important things do you think that we can do to affect how long we live? Well, I mean, looking backwards to what happens to human history of the past uh, century uh, centuries. Uh, what we saw that extended dramatically the what we call the median lifespan um, uh, of, of of our species are definitely uh, envir- you know interventions right so like uh, water sanitation for example this is a big one that uh, prevents the parasitic load that uh, kills uh, many uh, individuals of our species so we can um, by accessing clean water prevent all those problems and it's the use of antibiotics for sure uh, that extended dramatically lifespan in the beginning of the 20th century and vaccinations for sure were also like a big uh, a big you know were played a big big role into into extending lifespan and uh, and slowing down the aging process probably but uh, um, all this has to do with the fact that these interventions decrease the, the, the chance, the odds of dying um, of infectious diseases, right? Uh, so antibiotics, clean water, and um, and vaccines. So that really what is what gave a huge boost uh, to to our our lifespan. What's going to be extending even further lifespan in our species? I think now that we. Um, uh, we got rid of uh, those big killers for our species. It's a it's a it's a very open question. This is what I guess the aging field is uh, is uh, is grappling with now. Right. Do, but do you have a hunch? Like, do you think it's uh, could it be like fasting or diet or exercise or is it sure. some, some particular things we need to eat or? Well, I think that even though we uh, got rid, so like you know, I think. Again, looking at, uh, at what happens over the past few decades now, instead of centuries, after we got rid of the big killers, right, uh, these infectious diseases, we still, you know, are living longer and longer. So what happened to us? I think it's a lot has to do with uh, biomedical intervention and um, uh, early life interventions that may have increased and improved uh, the health of uh, uh, of younger individuals of our species. So I think also decreased smoking may have had like a huge impact on uh, um, on, on statistical lifespan because it's a statistical term, right? It's a very important thing to consider, right? Oftentimes we think, what can we do as individuals to 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 improve our health, and that eventually will extend our lifespan. But let's not forget that oftentimes when we discuss about these terms, we're talking about large number of you know large number of individuals. Now at the individual level. What uh, it's been emerging also from work in uh, experimental model organisms like mice, worms, flies, sometimes yeast and many others. It's yeah, like like you mentioned, uh, there are interventions that seem to be uh, universally uh, robustly um, able to extend lifespan and slow down the aging process. And one such intervention is uh, restricting diet. Uh, from what is the uh, normal diet that we we have access to, right? So having access to unlimited food resources, restricting diet to a certain degree uh, from a given age uh, seems to have a dramatic, uh, you know, uh, benefit in um, in our life expectancy and in uh, uh, and in our health. Um, so this is uh, this is a very robust result. However, what we don't really know much about is how much this intervention, as well as many others um, that have proven to extend lifespan, behave or react to, for example, to to the presence of, um, you know, to immune challenges, for example. So if uh, on top of being more robust, more resistant due to calorie restriction, for example, if we were to challenge more an individual uh, with uh, you know, disease-inducing parasite pathogens, for example, we don't really know how much that uh, intervention would be beneficial. Right. So, so it so it can be that it it can have an effect, perhaps, on 
on median lifespan or or perhaps even extending lifespan but it might may not have an effect on things that yeah parasites or viruses or things like in that. a very challenging environment having a, a reduced diet may not be necessarily uh, the best way to 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 go about but you know this is something we don't we don't know yet so basically what we study in model organisms oftentimes is a privileged uh husbandry right so you have very protected environments you have a very safe and uh, clean food and you have uh, no temperature oscillation in the environment so you you know your organisms are really sheltered in a way so uh, all these studies suggest that uh, under optimal conditions um, you know if you take away all the external insults if you wish uh, if you decrease diet, you know, dietary intake, you have an extension of lifespan. And this is a great result. This is extending lifespan means overall uh, improving um, um, homeostasis, improving uh, ways in which organisms can go back to equilibrium and repair themselves and, um, and, 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 and get a, a, around um, uh, more robustly. But uh, what we don't quite know is what happens when we challenge dramatically these organisms, as opposed to organisms that uh, have like a, a normal, uh, uh, a normal diet. I think that's that's very interesting. But this case, so I guess it's two things. So, so first of all, do you so so do you believe that from all the interventions that we have now, let's say that you, if you are a, a person living in a Western society, for example, and you have, yeah, you're living a Western lifestyle. Um, do you do you believe that fasting, so uh, fasting uh, and perhaps then not eating as many calories, perhaps or both, is the probably the best interventions for living longer that we know of right now? Um, probably is the most likely. Um intervention to be the best at this point as as far as uh, evidence goes i think that uh, uh, fasting may be uh, maybe the the, the 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 most robust intervention yes um i think that uh, there will be pharmacological interventions soon that will uh add on this as a as a beneficial intervention but i would say that um exercise and fasting probably be uh, up there yeah uh, you know this said uh, i also acknowledge the fact that um, from uh, um, centenarian studies uh, um, so you know there are there are laboratories around the world that study people who live very long time right so that they they go beyond 100 years or sometimes these ultra centenarians exceptionally healthy individuals that who live over 110 years uh, Oftentimes, there are reports of these individuals not being necessarily too slim, right? Sometimes yeah, you have yeah. actually, yeah. So, for example, the studies in Leiden uh, from uh, Elaine, Elaine Slackboom, uh, and even uh, the, the studies in uh, uh, Albert Einstein College in New York by Nir Barzilai, they showed actually that these centenarians and ultra centenarian families, oftentimes they are not that restricted in their diet. Mm. Yeah, so that's they may interesting. Have some, yeah. Yeah. Exactly. So maybe for the rest of us, it would be would be a good strategy to be restricted. But also, I have to I have to add something, right? So, um, what does what does it mean really restricting diet for a human being? So we know well what it what it means for a mouse because in mice we saw like you know laboratory mice we we have a standard diet and we provide diet you know we provide food ad libitum we say so uh, con- constantly to mice, right? So they, can, so they can eat how much they want basically. They can eat as yeah. much as they want. They are in these cages. They can access food all the time, uh, you know, uh, through through the whole throughout the whole day, right? But do actually wild mice, for example, do field mice um, eat as much as they want or have continuous access to food? I'm not sure about that. Actually, I think they will be always looking up for food. So, w- you know, would dietary restriction in wild mice, in other words, be as effective as dietary restriction in um, in captive mice? This is something that we don't really know, we don't understand. So, so maybe uh, all that we're doing with this dietary restriction concept is bringing back um, a di- diet intake to levels that are more closer to what are the, the wild conditions for mice, the, the natural conditions for mice. So in that respect, it wouldn't really be dietary restriction, but would actually reflect the fact that what we're doing with laboratory mice is we're, we're overfeeding them. 
And so what we're studying at the end of the day may not be the effect of dietary restriction, but the effect, you know, the detrimental effect of overfeeding. Now, I don't want to I don't want to confuse the audience, uh, but uh, I think we have to separate, you know, experimental work that um, is done on uh, uh, on captive uh, animals or organisms with, uh, you know, direct uh, interventions in, um, in, in humans, in our species. But maybe we are a little bit like captive mice after all. So maybe it's not that detrimental. That's so interesting. Because I think, I think that is a very, very interesting point. Can, can you elaborate a little bit on that? Sure. So um, I think that uh, this whole concept uh, of... Uh, um, you know, finding what is optimal in terms of um, food intake or what is the optical, optimal amount of time uh, in which we eat. Um, so maybe something that dietary restriction may be tending towards. So maybe maybe rather than restricting ourselves, we are actually are correcting our dietary regime to what we are expecting to be eating. Um, I mean, it's it's oftentimes tempting to to you know to make up uh, scenarios of uh, what our ancestors uh, would be eating, would have been eating, uh, how much they would have been eating, what type of diet, you know, paleo diet as opposed to uh, I don't know other types of diets, and so uh, there is a little bit of this thinking of what is the optimal type of of diet that we're having, but in a Western societies like as, as you were saying. We are far away from, uh, um, you know, uh, food intake in terms of volumes as well as, um, you know, nutrients uh, from what uh, uh, likely uh, our ancestors, omnivore ancestors, um, uh, used to uh, used to eat and, and and therefore have adapted their, you know, masticatory system, their gastrointestinal tract to uh, actually um, access uh, a given amount of food. So. You know, I can give you another example when we discuss about this concept of um, optimal uh, food intake rather than restricting diet, but more reaching like the optimal uh, optimal diet intake. There is an analogy in uh, in neuroscience, for example, that is this concept of environmental enrichment. So, and it, I go back to this uh, concept of you know laboratory mice being our reference model organism for for biomedical research, which is uh, it's a great resource, but it's also like provides a lot of a lot of biases to the way we understand and we think about human biology, right? Because a mouse is not a, a human being. Yeah. Uh, so there is this concept of environmental enrichment, which means that you provide mice, for example, in um, so normally you house mice with a few cage mates in little cages, and they have ad libitum access to food, and they're you know they are under you know light conditions and dark with 12 hour cycles now so researchers have discovered that if you actually house mice in large groups full of toys full of stimuli social stimuli olfactory stimuli um, they can move you know around and exercise more they are happy they develop better they, uh, they their immune system is boosted they maybe they also live longer actually i'm not sure about li lifespan but they're doing much better and so this protocol is called environmental enrichment. But again, just like, you know, dietary restriction, I wonder whether the normal way of keeping our mice in the lab yeah, actually yeah. is the is the real intervention, is the is the uh, is what we normally consider the norm. Uh, and instead, it's actually uh, not really normal it is abnormal. So in other ways, what is the optimal condition to 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 observe an organism? Uh, a research model organism, and uh, and this is why many many research groups actually study their organisms in their natural environments. Although it's much more harder to do that than than to do it in uh, in the lab, of course. Exactly. Yeah. Of course, there are advantages to both the both yeah. ways of doing studies. But yeah, but that that is a fascinating thought that it it might be. Or it's. I mean, it also seems very likely that if you have mice alone in a cage for example or if you ha have them having them in, in a cage with just food and water and perhaps one or two friends and if you have them in this you know my mouse or rat paradise with you know cheese right. and these you know they can run around in, in running wheels and stuff that we're actually depriving them of their optimal environment in a way exactly yeah and so what we have found for example in my group is that uh, you know, oftentimes, you know, thinking also about interventions and uh, what what is it what is the environment out there, and 
you know, there is this expectation uh, for a given type of environment for an, uh, for an organism, if you think about it, right? So in a way, organisms is like they have, you know, even before being exposed to an environment, they have hypotheses of what their environment should be looking like, right? So the way our sensory organs are formed, the way our masticatory system, our gastrointestinal tract is, is shaped, it's in a way, a way to have an uh, informed guess of how their optimal environment yeah. should be looking like, right? Yeah. Uh, their size, their body temperature, et cetera, right? So those are optimal for specific type of conditions, right? Uh, those are adaptation to specific environments, of course. And so what we have found, for example, is that, uh, and you know, this is a field that now is actually is rapidly developing within the aging, aging field, is that when it comes to aging um, uh, in many organisms, what actually really matters also is uh, this what we call this very complex intermediate layer uh, of biological complexity that sits at the interface between the organism and the environment out, out there. So there is actually uh, a very important aspect of biology that uh, we have been neglecting for a very long time. And that can, really, can, you, can you just explain that? I, I didn't quite understand what you just meant. Can you just explain that a little bit further? Yes. So there is a, a level of biological uh, richness and complexity that sits at the interface between uh, organisms and environment and the external stimuli, let's say, that we have been neglecting for a long time. I'm, I'm talking about, I'm hinting at the micro microbes that actually are um, uh, oftentimes um, inhabiting uh, these uh, surfaces, right? So uh, um, epithelia, so these are actually uh, these barriers between uh, the organism itself and the environment out there. If, right. you, if you think of so, so, mm -hmm. it's, so it's kind of like the that we have the world that then can affect the bacteria, which then affects us. Or that's that, right. Okay. So the bacteria, we can think about this this kind of like uh, microbial um, membrane, if you want, this microbial uh, layer. It's as an intermediate, uh, as a mediator for the environment right uh, for us. right yeah exactly so it's like a middle step that also right. i mean that affects us and again get affected by how we live and everything exactly okay, so yeah. uh, all the stimulation that we get from outside from temperature to light to chemicals to water uh, a lot of the a lot of the um uh, you know even sensory organs or um you know our uh, skin or our intestine or um, our mucosal membranes are covered in very, very rich microbial um, communities. Uh, and these microbial communities are there opportunistically sometimes, but they're also there to, which means opportunistically means that they happen to be there and they, you know, they make the best out of that opportunity. But some are actually specialized uh, in specific in specific places and and we seem to have co-evolved with them so that's there is a very long natural history of co-evolution between uh the host the in, the organism and this microbial this very very complex microbial uh, ecosystem that sits on the on these membranes and uh and now to reconnect to re to, to 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 go back to the aging issue so what um, um, what we have been hypothesizing in my lab is uh, whether this this these microbes do play a role in uh, in, in modulating uh, and in buffering um, physiological processes, and in particular within the aging uh, spectrum of phenotypes of, um, of of functions. So what we've been asking, in other words, is whether these microbes that cover us. Uh, matter during the aging process, whether they help us stay healthy uh, when we are in good health, uh, and whether they also can tip the balance towards more uh, accelerated disease progression when we actually uh, are start fading away, when we are start aging, for instance, and whether we can uh, manipulate the aging process by directly manipulating these complex microbial communities. Very interesting. So, yeah, so, so we have these bacteria and these other organisms. And if we can perhaps help them, then perhaps they can help us to live longer. That's right. So we know that these bacteria uh, are essential for us. So, for example, those bacteria in our uh, intestine uh, are very important to um, the digestion of uh, several um, 
food types. So uh, starches and uh, you know uh, fibers are uh, massively processed by uh, bacteria in, in our you know in our intestine. Right. We know that we depend on this bacteria to uh, synthesize essential uh, molecules, right? So like vitamin B, vitamin K, these are essential. And bacteria in our gut synthesize those. We cannot synthesize them on, on ourselves. We can get them with a diet independently from the bacteria. If we, for example, you know, pop pills of uh, with vitamins. <laughs> yeah. But bacteria, uh, I mean, but you know, bacteria is that you know they have the genes, they have the the molecular machinery, they have the molecular uh, engines to generate those vitamins that we depend on. So they are kind of like you can look at them as factories, kind of vitamin B twelve factories and vitamin right. K factories inside of you, which you can exactly. which which you can then you can either help the factory or you can just yeah not burn exactly. down the factory. <laughs> That's right. So uh, you actually, so since we need those factories, in a way, we have to find ways to 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 house them, to host them, to 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 foster their presence in us, right? So right. that's where our co-evolution comes, right? So how can you know how can we provide for them an environment that it's conducive to to be there and not to be replaced or displaced by other other bacteria? Because you know. In there, there is a lot of things happening, right? In the intestine, you know, there is there are thousands of different species of bacteria, fungi, viruses, and little uh, eukaryotes, you know, um, you know, protists, etc. That uh, this is a very very complex ecology. Actually, as far as we understand, the intestine of vertebrate has the largest, you know, the highest density uh, the highest of, of different species of bacteria is the is the ecosystem with the highest uh, diversity of microbes per uh, per surface so this is a very very unique place so they have a For, like yeah they have a lot a lot a lot of different diff a lot of different bacteria and other things that's right and they do a lot of things they do a lot of things there and they do a, they can do a lot more things than we can do i would just like to give you like a uh, just um a framework for this. Yeah, sure. So we have something like twenty thousand genes, right? Yeah. Uh, we humans. Uh, if you cumulatively count how many genes are there in all the microbes that live in our gastrointestinal tract, you have something like two order magnitude more genes. So instead of like twenty thousand, you have something like what is one order magnitude more is actually two hundred thousand. And one order of magnitude more is two million. So you have actually a lot more bacterial genes that are available to us than our own genes. So, so it's it's pretty much like we have ten percent human genes and we have like ninety percent bacterial genes in our bodies. Well, so exactly. So it's actually it's one percent. You know, it's like one percent. Yeah, 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 yeah. Wow. Yeah. yeah. So, uh, so, but of course, um, we have. Uh, a lot of human cells uh, and we also have a lot of bacterial cells out there so actually it used to be believed that we have 10 times more microbial than human cell actually now it seems to be we have as many microbial cells as human cells right. that we carry around right uh, and uh, there are bacterial species that are more abundant than others so the you know the relative representation of genes uh, it's not even, right? So you will have the more do the predominant uh, bacteria that will uh, will be there. So it, they are not evenly distributed. Like you know, you have more one type as opposed to another type, right? Right. Um, and there will be the more rare bacterial species, right? Uh, that add to the count of genes, but they don't necessarily. Uh, they are not highly represented. Uh, in terms of like individual bacterial species, but uh, also what I wanted to to say is that you know we strictly depend on 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 these bacteria, so um, we cannot imagine a life uh, without them, right? So if we didn't have these bacteria, we wouldn't have access to vitamin you know B and K unless we we take them otherwise, and we wouldn't have like a mature immune system. So our immune system strictly depends on these bacteria to actually undergo maturation and 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 proper development, and also these bile acids that we uh, in part synthesize uh, to to you know provide digestion, they are processed by by bacteria. So they are processed into secondary bile acids directly by 
by these intestinal bacteria. So we are, again, strictly dependent on these diverse communities of microbes that um, not just for the digestion process, but also for other process or immune system alteration, they give us a huge, you know, they, they, they serve us like a very important function. And that is also so interesting because I, I think that like the effect of something is also very important. And like, I mean, if, if, if it comes to the microbiome or the entire human body, if we have 50% cells that are non-human, then it's right. quite <laughs> possible or that, that they actually play a very important part for us yeah. as humans also it's not like it's just one percent or something it's, it's a huge part that's right so of course weight wise you know we weight more than you know uh than than our bacteria right so we don't have to think that uh, if i am 70 kilo uh adult male uh uh 35 kilos are bacteria uh, you know it's due to bacteria right so uh bacterial cells are much smaller than our cells but yeah. You're right. Um, they, uh, if you count the number of bacterial cells as opposed to human cells, uh, yeah, we seem to have a one-to-one -one ratio. Even if you take a, a blood draw um, from from a human being and you actually try to catalog these little molecules that are floating around in the blood, these are called metabolites, the small molecules, and you see, and you ask. How many of those actually come from bacteria and how many of those come from our own biological processes that do not depend on bacteria? That actually we'll see that a very large portion of the metabolites present in our blood are bacterial born. Really? Yeah. <laughs> wow. <laughs> yeah, I, I think it's just it's just this thing about, I mean, just understanding from my perspective i've i've i mean we've heard a lot about the microbiome and it's getting more and more popular but i don't think that a lot of people understand probably the effect that it seems to have right and so our question was since they are so important for basic processes like digestion immune system alteration we started you know questioning or asking do they play a role during aging? Do they are, are are they important during aging? So what you know, uh, do they help us stay healthy? And what happens to them, for example, when we get older? Right. Is there a change in microbial composition when we get older? And can we restore health by manipulating microbes? So these are the types of questions that we we like to ask. So interesting. Let's get into this. So. Uh, uh, you know, what we do in my lab is actually to, uh, uh, to ask these kind of crazy questions. And uh, we have the fortune to, to work with a, a very special model organism, which is a very short-lived fish, right? So we, we have an opportunity to, uh, to ask these questions in uh, experimental systems. Uh, we can do that, of course, in mice, in little worms, which are like very popular model organisms that are used in the in laboratories but we um, as a lab we uh, we work with um, short-lived fish that come from africa and this fish give us the opportunity the reason why we study them is because this fish give us the opportunity to ask this sort of questions for example what is the impact of microbes during the aging process and have the answer in a relatively short time this fish that we study are extremely short-lived they live about three four months and that's it and so we can do like an experimental manipulation. We can change temperature, provide drugs or manipulate the microbes and then see what is the result of this manipulation, get, the res get to the, down to the, to the answer in a few months instead of waiting for years and years as it would happen for an experiment that studies the intervention uh, on lifespan and aging in mice. Mice right, live several right. years. So uh, to go back to the main question, so we wanted to know what happens when we manipulate microbes. So first of all, the first question was, is there a change happening during aging in the microbiota? Uh, and this question was already uh, asked by others. So uh, other groups have already uh, asked this question in humans. Uh, and there were, there were observations that uh, indeed during aging, there are dramatic changes in the microbiota composition. Uh, young individuals seem to have more diverse microbiota composition and older individuals, in particular sick individuals, so individuals who are more frail, they have less diverse microbiota. 
So um, could, 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 could you could you say that uh, a diverse so having many many different species is all is better than having fewer species? As far as we can tell, having more species is associated with uh, higher you know better health. Whether this is actually causal related, it's another question. We know that higher health, better health, uh, goes hand in hand with having more microbes uh, um, under normal conditions. Um, and so, what I'm so this concept of diversity is very important, right? So it's a it's an ecological concept. Is how many different types uh, of one kind you have, right? So how many different bacterial. Uh, species, for example, let's call them the species you have in a given individual, that could be a good indicator uh, to some extent of of of, um, of health and and uh, and healthy aging, if you wish. Right. So so, uh, but interestingly, any two older individuals. So if you take one old individual, that maybe frail with some you know uh, higher risk of 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 um, of disease, and you know with uh, with some diseases, chronic diseases already. Like those individuals, the so older individual have fewer, so lower diversity, if you wish. But be, if, if you compare any two old individuals, they will be very different from one another. Mm. So it's not that as you get older, you will in a predictable way have fewer bacteria, but the same types, right? The same bad guys, for example, right? Mm. So that doesn't seem to be the case. What has seemed to happen is that you sample from the initial diverse community a subset of microbes. So that means that any old individual will have fewer microbes, but it will be different from another old individual that still has few, like a few microbes, but different microbes right, from the other right. one. Yeah. So that means if you compare any two old individuals, actually they will be very different from one another in their microbial composition. Right. So you see that is a little bit of a, of, a, of a trap, of a semantic trap there. Because if we think about young individuals, each young individual has a very diverse microbiota. Yeah. But and by and large, young individuals are very similar to one another in that they have a very diverse microbiota. Right. But then if you take old individuals, they will have few microbes, but they will have different subset of microbes, uh, uh, one from the other, right? So there will be diverse from one another in a way they will be different from one another in a way right very interesting okay so so the the older ones they have different microbiotas and it also differs from when, when you're younger you have a more diverse you have more species than if you That's are right. if, if you're older and and that also then seems to affect us i, I guess i mean if if we have if we have yeah. a yeah, yeah, go on. <laughs> so we, we don't. So exactly. So does it affect us? Is the is the is the really important question. So uh, is the is the diversity per se or the composition of the microbes that we have as we young? What is it that connects diversity of microbes with uh, with younger state? It's simply like a um, you know um, a feature of being young that has no direct impact on our health. You know, having more you know, the more diverse microbial community, or actually there is a causal role, there is an uh, important causal role of having a diverse microbiota. This is exactly what we asked. So what we could do in the fish is not just describing uh, what happens during aging to diverse microbial community. And we did see that just like in humans and in mice, older killifish that we study have much fewer microbes as younger individuals and when i say fewer microbes i mean you have lower diversity of microbes right um but then we ask the question of all right is this diversity relevant for for health and so what we wanted to know is we wanted to manipulate the system we wanted to give the old individuals uh, young microbes, so microbes coming from uh, um, young individuals. Okay. Right. Yeah. Yeah. So, so in other words, we wanted to uh, replace uh, the microbiota composition of a middle-aged individual, like 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 a fifty-year-old human being, with microbes. So before the you know the dramatic aging process really like uh, ensues, so a little bit earlier than really like a, an aged individual, uh, we wanted to intervene. Uh, you know, at the beginning of the aging process or through the aging process by replacing, by, by, by manipulating the, the microbiota. 
right. of these individuals. So, so you, you basically you wanted to take uh, take the like the microbiome from a younger one, like a twenty year old, and put that into a fifty year old and see what happens. That's right. That's exactly right. Wow. So we took an adult, you know, uh, adult uh, but healthy, uh, you know, microbes from adult individuals, uh, and then we uh, treated the old individuals, like the middle age individuals, actually, with antibiotics. So we we killed the resident microbes right. into these fish, and then the, we transplanted, we provided the recipient, the middle age individuals, with microbes coming from the young one, from the young adult one, like you said. Right, and and then we 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 actually um, uh, we were hoping that this this intervention would actually be you know uh, effective. Effective means not necessarily that it would lead to a uh, a result eventually, but we wanted to make sure that actually the microbes were colonizing the, the 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 recipient fish, right? So we wanted to make sure that this intervention was successful in the sense that there was indeed an establishment of this microbial community in the recipient. When you do an experiment, you can't be blind to the to the to the fact that maybe you you hope you're doing like a microbiota transfer, but it, it doesn't really work. I mean you 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 did your your due diligence, but then eventually maybe the microbes don't settle in. So we had to do all these tests to make sure that actually the microbes were going from the donor to the recipient. Okay. Okay. Yeah. And after we did that, we were sure that actually the, 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 the fish were accepting this uh, donor's microbes. And then what we found eventually is that there is a huge benefit when you transfer microbes from young individuals to middle age individual. Uh, so there is a huge benefit to the health and to the lifespan, to the aging process of these middle age mice. In other words, middle age mice receiving, sorry, fish, middle age right? fish. Yeah. Receiving, uh, and I, I will tell you why I had this lapsus because, you know, we have a follow up study now in mice. Yeah. But, yeah. Uh, yeah. So when we transfer microbes from young adult fish to uh, middle age fish, actually, we did have an extension in lifespan. That's it. So now this experiment it, per se uh, is intriguing, it opens up a lot of new questions. But I, I need to point out that also this, this result made sense. Uh, uh, in the in, in light of the experimental design, so it's very important that we also did a control study. This is very important studies when we do this type of experimental intervention, where we transfer microbes from the same age group, so the middle age individuals, yeah, to the middle age individuals again. So we wanted to make sure that it's not just transferring microbes yeah, that yeah. so any type of microbes from any type of donor that it's sufficient to extend lifespan. Maybe you're just challenging the system, right? And then you sort of like benefit from this dramatic intervention. So, uh, and we know that it was not just the antibiotic intervention that was beneficial. Uh, it was not just a transfer, any transfer of microbes, but was specifically the transfer of microbes from young individuals to middle age individuals that was extending dramatically the fish lifespan. That is so interesting. I, I, then I really need to know, <laughs> like, how how much longer do they live? If it, yeah. Yeah, I mean, uh, I think they live like uh, twenty eight to thirty percent longer. So th th this is a very very massive extension. Twenty eight to thirty percent li yeah, longer. Something like that. Yeah. So, so I that, don't remember the exact number, but I, I think it's in that order of magnitude. Yeah. So, so that is like if you're, let's say you're a, let's say you're a eighty. 80 year old then you live 24 years older until you're 104 or if you're 50 then right. you become like yeah i now my math doesn't work but it's it's a, yeah, I mean, so, it's a lot of years if you would compare it to a human yeah so humans for example we have median lifespan of what is it 81 like in in, in central europe like 79 81 so you can imagine like the life expectancy of um, like an extension in lifespan of 20 something years right so 22 24 years i guess more so that's 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 quite yeah that's that's quite dramatic and then, and then of course we're not saying that we we know that this would happen in a human but it's still it's very interesting that i mean it makes you wonder what effects it would have on a human for example Exactly. So, uh, of course, we don't know whether this would work in humans, but uh, I have to say also that this type of experiment, I have to say two things. So first that this type of experiment was really um, um, suggested to us, was inspired by what happens already in humans when it comes to specific type of diseases. So the, the intervention of this um, transferring microbes from donor to recipient 
It's something that we do already in the clinical practice. So this is called FMT, fecal uh, microbiota transfer, right? Yeah, yeah. Uh, so so this happens when humans um, uh, are are um, sick with a very very this you know. Uh, uh, devastating disease, which is this Clostridialis, you know, C. diff uh, infection. So there are these nosocomial infections that affect the gastrointestinal tract, and these poor patients have this recurrent diarrheas, and they have this uh, one microbe that completely takes over this beautiful microbial diversity that normally should be there in the yeah, intestine. Yeah. So there is one species that takes it all; is the winner, right? Uh, it's just you have a monoculture of this bacterium that or you have predominant, you know, like high, high predominance of this bacteria that uh, uh, takes over the microbial community. And and these, these, these patients are a very high risk of dying because of this. Right. Yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, uh, because of all the reasons that we said before, because we need that diversity to to keep us alive. Right. Yeah. Uh, and so what uh, uh, in the medical clinic has, has been going on is actually to do this intervention when you have a healthy donor uh, that, don't, you know, uh, basically provides these patients with uh, fecal material. So it is as dirty as that. Uh, but the donor has to be healthy. Normally is a young individual. Normally is a relative. Normally is a healthy relative of the patient. Right. Yeah, yeah. And so you provide this fecal microbiota transfer. And the effects have been so uh amazingly effective of the, of the effect of this transfer that you know patients really have been healed by by this uh, by this intervention so there is a very very high success rate so we're talking about in the 90 percent you know of um, of recovering from uh, from from this uh, fmt this fecal microbiota transfer so in other words we were reflecting on the fact that we can benefit host by transferring bacteria in the context of a disease right right Right. So we were wondering whether if aging is a like a disease in a way or a collection of diseases, whether like, you know, transferring microbes from a healthy individual would sort of somehow uh, go along similar directions as this fecal microbiota transfer uh, yeah. that happens in humans. And in fish, at least. So we have to be very careful in our conclusions and in generalization. But in, in our fish, at least it worked very, very very nice. But, but Dar, I have to ask you that. And this is so interesting. I mean, what... What do you believe? I mean, this is just hypothesizing, of course. But what do you believe yeah. would happen if, let's say, we take a very healthy 20-year-old who lives like a very healthy life, eat a lot of different, you know, sauerkraut, um, kombucha, <laughs> and all this, you know, all this good stuff for your gut, gut, gut microbiome. And then you will give a fecal transplant to a random 50-year-old. I mean, we're not, yeah. not, not talking about a 50-year-old, but a random 50-year-old. What, yeah. like, what, what do you think? I don't know. I, I think it may be risky. You know, like we have a lot of viruses in our gastrointestinal tract. So I think we have a lot of. Um, so the the twenty year old is also resilient, right? So he, yeah. he also has probably or she has also a very very effective immune system, right? So that uh, is able to withstand insult better than a fifty year old. So if the microbes per se per se are providing the benefit uh, to uh, individuals that are genetically different and have like a different uh, lifestyle, I don't know. What would be actually more efficient or maybe safer? Uh, I don't know if more efficient. I can also talk about maybe a safer approach would be if we were to collect our own microbiota record throughout oh, our own life. Oh, right. We were, well, maybe maybe we can resolve back and, and get back to our own microbiota from a time where we were particularly right. good, good health, good shape, great diet. So maybe we should have our, our poop a store in the freezer and then resolve to that in times of, uh, uh, of, um, of disease or maybe even when we use antibiotics, right? So maybe you can think about recovering from your own microbes, uh, you know, intestinal microbes exactly. from, from a source. So probably that's a, it's a, that is a more, you know, viable option uh, than transferring uh, blindly from a, uh, from a uh, allegedly healthy uh, donor. Right. But wouldn't, wouldn't you see, I mean, uh, for, first of all, that, that, that is a, a very, very interesting idea. Second of all, um, wouldn't you see the problem you just talked about if you are young then perhaps you have some bad stuff also yeah. um wouldn't wouldn't you see that problem also in the fishes taking uh, like a random young fish giving it to a random middle-aged fish sure 
Absolutely. So, uh, you know, we have to consider the fact that, again, you know, this uh, uh, studies that we do, uh, uh, the, the results that we observe, you know, that we uh, we score are statistics, right? So we we see that there is an median lifespan extension. So you have a massive extension in lifespan, but we haven't looked at every single individual. Fish. So if one fish actually lives a little bit shorter, so yeah. you will have, you know, in a way, you can run the risk of actually challenging individuals who are immune compromised that would otherwise have been doing all right with their uh, with their microbiota. Uh, right. By transferring them, we may be actually harming them. So overall, we have a massive benefits in this fish cohort that lives under very very controlled conditions in laboratory. To go back to the to the husbandry as we did before, as we discussed before. Uh, but we wouldn't know what would happen, for example, in a wild fish, for instance. Or yeah, so. Um, I, I, I don't know whether uh, overall, uh, with, in all individuals, this would be the, the safest, uh, the safest uh, intervention. Right. Probably, even though if it's the statistically safer for most of them to, to do that, it may be still risky for some individuals. But, but have, you, have, you, have you seen that in your studies, that some of, of the middle-aged fishes become, become ill and die or become ill and die prematurely? Uh, sure. I mean, you have individuals dropping out of the study, you know, uh, they, they die, you know, we, we cannot, we cannot know for sure whether they are dying because of the intervention. Of course, so there of is course. a lot of stochasticity in that. So, so we cannot at this, at this point with the numbers we had right now, we cannot actually, uh, we cannot see uh, this trend, this particular trend. But like I said, you know, these are fish in aquaria that are very, very clean. But I wanted to add one thing because we did also the reverse experiment. So we also did, so we asked again this question of whether any challenge in microbiota is beneficial, right? So we also transfer microbes from old individuals to young individuals. Oh, okay. And I wanted to tell you about this because yeah, it's, yeah. It's, it's, it's very yeah, instructive. Yeah. So what we found when we transfer microbes from old individuals to young individuals, and again, as a control, we also did a transfer from young individuals to young individuals to make sure that, you know, we're taking all the, um, all the caveats. Exactly, exactly, the caveats exactly. Away. Yeah. What we see is that the young individuals don't age faster. So when you give them like old individuals microbes, Really? So they actually are able to bounce back to their age match microbial composition. So they they snap back uh, into where you know the microbiota composition they they would have had even if they didn't have the the, the uh, undergone the transfer. So in okay. other words, there is intrinsically a way that uh, young individuals are able to to go back to a healthier state. So that really, to us, indicates that uh, uh, there is a crosstalk between immune system most likely. And a microbiota, in uh, you know, conspiring to in 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 in, in um, creating a healthy uh, a healthy system. Right, but and again, just like what is it that we learn from that? So what we learn is that we are resilient as young. And is there anything else we learn from that? Well, we are resilient as young, and uh, there is a benefit in uh, young associated microbes. I mean, there is definitely what we see is that microbes, this diverse community of microbes that is more present in young individuals, does have a very, very beneficial, does play a very beneficial effect in old. Yeah. So uh, at least in our in our experimental ex experimental setting, so we know that there is a massive benefit in transferring these microbes. Uh, so we did actually um, gut content. We didn't do like fecal transfer. So we actually took the, the whole gut content. So we don't know whether fecal transfer would be as effective. But so what we can see for now is that, um, you know, microbes associated with young individuals seem to have a very important role in modulating the aging process in, uh, uh, in, 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 in this organism, in this fish. What, what does that mean, what you just said, that you didn't do a fecal transplant? So you, so you yeah, what does that mean? Well, you know, there are different microbiota compositions. So there is the, the intestinal microbiota. So, the, you know, the intestine is a very complex uh, uh, structure, right? So you start, uh, you know, with, you know, stomach and then you go into duodenum, et cetera, et cetera, right? And so you have microbiota associated to each compartment, right? So you right. have the microbes, you have, you know, based on acidity, et cetera, et cetera, you have different types of microbes in different, in different parts of the, of the gut. 
So what we did actually was to take off all the gut content. So we we scraped off the, mi the intestinal microbes, and we that's what we, what we transferred to the to the fish to the recipient fish. Normally in humans or also in mice, oftentimes it, what you do actually is to transfer the stool microbiota. So you take fecal pellets and you provide those to the to the to the to the recipient. And right. those normally the fecal pellets, it's not exactly corresponding to the intestinal microbiota in terms of composition because it's more uh, representative of the of the distal part of the intestine of the colon of the uh, of the rectum so of the of the very last parts of the intestine right right it's slightly different community this was just a, a technical a technical um, um, uh, you know note from my side right right uh, yeah it, it would also be very interesting to to get into you said that you did some follow up studies when you used the when yeah. you used mice perhaps we can talk about that well, I mean, I, I, I hope I will be able to talk to, to you about this like uh, in a few months because the study is under, <laughs> yeah. undergoing. So what we did actually was to yeah to follow mice individually. So we, we actually can scan them. You know, we can know how their microbiota is changing over time. So we haven't published this story yet. It's still like, you know, ongoing. And then we did this microbiota transfer just like we did in the fish. So we want to know how much of this microbiota transfer is effective in modulating lifespan in mice. And we yeah. don't know the answer yet. Yet. So we don't know whether young microbes also in mice do provide a benefit to the host. So um, this is something very much that we are curious to, 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 to know. And um, um, yeah, so we're doing our due diligence to do this experiment also through this, uh, you know, difficult times with right. um, this pandemic. Yeah. Right. Yeah, we'll do a perhaps we'll do a follow up on that then later on when yes. you when you when you know more about that. Um, yeah. Uh, what I also think would be very interesting to know, uh, another thing about just the microbiome, from my understanding is that uh, that there's been studies on the Hadza, so the one of the last hunter-gatherers yeah. who lived like we did before, um, yeah. and that they have a much more diverse microbiota than we do. Um, yeah. what, what do you think like what do you think the defect, uh, the effects are of that? Yeah, so it's interesting. I think this is a study done uh, part by a group at Stanford by Sonnenberg, uh, Justin Sonnenberg, uh, team. Uh, yeah, so it's interesting. Also in the Yanomami, so this uh, uh, Amazon uh, dwelling human uh, communities uh, in Brazil, also they have very you know high higher diversity of microbes compared to Western society. And the uh, as as far as I remember the studies. Uh, the authors uh, imply that they have a much more diverse diet. Uh, they eat different types of food than we do, uh, and uh, and overall, this higher diversity compared to to us uh, speaks for their higher health, um, better health. I am uh, this latter part. I'm not entirely sure about because uh, I mean uh, Hadza and uh, Yanomami don't. That seem to live as long as we do, or they don't seem to age as gracefully as we do. Although with the caveat that we have access to different types of uh, uh, of uh, healthcare system than they do. Yeah. Uh, so I think the jury is still out to what does it mean to have like that type of diversity as opposed to ours. So you know there is a big confounder, which is the environment, of course, there yeah. that uh, we cannot um, we cannot easily exclude. So I, w I wonder what would like an individual with such a high diversity as the Hadza or the Yanomami would be doing in an environment like ours. So or vice versa, how much would an individual with uh, microbiota diversity as ours would do? Uh, would fare in the Hadza uh, or Yanomami environment or um, yeah so I think that yeah this is uh, very interesting and it's a very important uh, uh, you know piece of this puzzle of the human microbiota diversity this is very really cool uh, cool stuff uh, but I think in terms of functional relevance uh, we can tell something uh, from microbiota community by studying what genes are there what genes are not there we can have some sort of like estimate of what those microbes are doing to some extent, but when it comes to health uh, and uh, you know risk for diseases, I think we are still far from understanding that. Right. I think. I think. Like. <laughs> I guess it's <laughs> perhaps two things again. One thing that I'm, I'm thinking about is that um, I mean, what we seem to know, from my understanding, is that the more diverse microbiome you have, the better it is. Kinda, as as a rule of thumb. Um, which makes me think that 
if we would eat, I mean, the Hadza tribe probably eats very diverse. And, and there's also these studies, from my understanding, that which show that like the best thing you can do for your microbiota is to eat a lot of different good stuff, like a lot of different vegetables, a lot of different seeds, nuts, everything. Um, yeah. Which really just makes sense that their way of eating, going back again to what you said before, perhaps is like the kind of optimal way for us to eat. Yeah, I mean, um, it it could be. I mean, uh, I think I think one has to always um, compare. Probably even within the Hadza would have been very interesting to know uh, uh, whether diversity in different individuals correlates uh, with uh, some health measures of those same individuals. Yeah. You know what I mean? So uh, what if individuals within the Hadza, the Yanomami uh, that are, you know, even at the same age, what if you can have like a health score, a way to score health, right? So like uh, based on blood glucose and uh, I don't know, grip strength and whatever else, yeah, um, yeah. body mass index, you know, all these uh, all these measures that somehow tell how, how, how healthy you are, right? Uh, uh, and then look at uh, microbiota diversity. Yeah, However, yeah. one big caveat there and one big uh, issue to, to take into consideration is kind of like uh, which way goes the causation. If yeah. any yeah. causation. Yeah. Right? Because it may be that, you know, a healthier immune system, uh, a, whatever it means, I don't want to go too much into detail into that, uh, is an immune system that it's able to afford a more diverse microbial community, which in another uh, immune compromised system would be very, very dangerous, for instance. So having all these different microbes in an environment that it's not able to uh, carefully scan and, you know, and, 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 and defend itself from, uh, from this continuous challenge of having a different, uh, different, different microbes, uh, it may be actually more detrimental than not to have diverse microbiota. So even the concept of having diverse microbiota being beneficial, probably this also has to do with you know, under what conditions. For me, under the condition of a good immune system may be good. Um, in other conditions, we don't know. I mean, it, it may be, but we still don't know. I think it's uh, it's it's still risky to jump to uh, to hasty conclusions. Yeah, 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 for sure. But I, I mean, that that's a very good point, though, that it, or a very good thought that that the immune system seems to be or the immune system can have an effect of how many different bacteria in which environment that you're that you, yeah where you're living in a, in a good way yeah this is something that it's uh it's very much acknowledged now that the immune system has this role you know this capacity to scan and to be permissive towards certain types of microbes and to be more uh, you know, uh, cautious and uh, aggressive uh, against certain types of microbes, right? Classically, uh, immunology has been uh, uh, seen as the field of, uh, you know, th there is this concept of warfare. You always protect yourself from parasites and pathogens and you have to kill, destroy, etc. But immune system also has a very important role in tolerance, right? So immune system can foster wow, yeah. uh, tolerance. So actually there is this whole uh, novel, you know, newly discovered functions of immune system into enabling specific bacteria to to be there and not be destroyed actually the intestinal immune system in particular is extremely good at this right so there are niche you know parts of the immune system in the gut that can suppress this uh, pro-inflammatory uh, programs so we have automatic response mechanisms against pathogens um, of different sorts so you know there is innate adaptive immunity uh, and uh, uh, in presence of uh, microbes that seem to be commensal which means they seem to be doing uh, benefit to, to, to us and to be sitting uh, there um, with us uh, on, on this epithelia, we are able and our immune system is able to um, uh, to inhibit itself from, uh, from attacking those microbes. Hence, uh, providing microbes with a niche, with, a, with substrate for, uh, for, for growth. Right. So... Um, so immune system, like a healthy immune system, is not just an immune system that attacks enemies and parasites, but it also is an immune system that recognizes the friends and uh, let them, you know, uh, uh, thrive in a given environment. And just, just and probably so, this is what leads to diversity in a way. Just so I understand, it, are you also saying that, like, perhaps it's like the one bacteria could be good for one person with a good immune system and be bad for another one or is it just that 
the immune system is able to detect whether it's a good one or not and not just kill everything. Right. So a couple of things here. So uh, I think there is this uh, kind of like healthy uh, immune system. And it's able to detect uh, and uh, respond properly to a given uh, to a given uh, uh, given microbe uh, to, to, uh, towards a given microbe. So that has to do with immune health. Maybe like a, uh, uh, an older immune system does the opposite, right? Maybe an older immune system will be permissive towards the pathogen and it will be aggressive and pro pro you know it will mount. Uh, pro-inflammatory responses, so it will attack the, the friends in a way, right? So right. you can see sort of like uh, uh, paradoxical uh, uh, dysfunctions. At the same time, what you said in the beginning, it's I think it's still not entirely understood whether some microbes may be beneficial to some individuals and less beneficial to other. I think the answer is maybe, uh, uh, maybe, maybe at this stage in the sense that the function of a given microbes may not be necessarily uniquely dependent on the presence of the microbes itself. That's it. It may be also dependent on what other microbes are there, right? So maybe microbe A as a role in presence of microbe B right. that is completely different when it's in presence of microbe C. You see the complexity yeah, of the yeah, system. Yeah. Right? It's Espe extremely espe complex. Especially when you have like hundreds and hundreds of thousands exactly. of exactly. different but then exactly but then there is this also this concept of pathobionts so these are microbes pathobionts means that this is a microbe that uh, is actually there it's not particularly harmful at some point but then under certain conditions that are changing can become harmful right ah, right so you can actually take advantage of certain types of changes in environment maybe due i don't know chemical changes or presence or absence of specific other types of microbes and then you can turn into like a, an enemy uh on top of that to add complexity to what i'm just telling you <laughs> yeah it is also the concept of microbial evolution so within this microbial world and the dynamics I'm, I'm i'm you know very briefly superficially touching upon are ecological dynamics species a that replaces species b etc or interacts with other microbial species you can also have within you know, particular microbes, uh, taxa, species, you can have evolution, you can have new Darwinian evolution with more pathogenicity, right? So you can have new mutations that, ma that make that specific microbes, you know, you, know you, you, you have the emergence of a new, you know, uh, pathogenic strain, for yeah, instance. Yeah, yeah. And that, that is also something to, to, to keep in mind. Wow. Dario, there's just so much still to learn about this stuff, and it's so fascinating. Um, be, before we end the conversation, is there something else that you would like to mention or something? Uh, no, I mean, as you see, you know, like going from uh, uh, the basic understanding of all this, these processes to intervention, I think it's still... Um, um, like ambitious, so I think that uh, suggesting uh, interventions based on a microbiota to improve human health uh, has to be done really uh, with maximum uh, care. But I think yeah. that uh, uh, still there is hope. I mean, uh, microbes seem to be very important immune modulators, uh, and so if we can harness the you know from the understanding of uh, these basic processes ways to improve immune health for instance uh, through molecules that are secreted by these microbes um uh, maybe maybe we, we you know we can hope to uh, to improve the aging process yeah for sure so yeah so so, so what is your uh, what is your take home message from our conversation to people listening well, that, uh, you know, sometimes you have this wonderful uh, universe and ecology inside yourself. Like, you know, we are moving uh, ecosystems. And I think that uh, if we can foster like basic research into understanding uh, these processes, uh, we can probably find uh, uh, interventions that can benefit uh, our society. So I, I'm a big advocate for basic science, uh, for, you know, curiosity driven science. Uh, and we are discovering that uh, uh, um, what works uh, so all, all these concepts that have been developed in evolutionary biology and ecology uh, actually apply very well to uh, topics that are very relevant to biomedical research nowadays so we were studying birds and whatever flies and yeast and in, in nature and now we discovered that those same equations and those same concepts that were developed uh, uh, in those fields that may not seem as applied as we thought initially 
instead now are extremely useful to understand what what happens inside us uh, as we interact with our microbes, for instance. So uh, the take home message is that, uh, uh, yeah, uh, curiosity driven science eventually uh, benefits society. Uh, and that uh, when it comes to, to aging, I think that uh, looking at the complexity of, uh, you know, interactions among organisms uh, can give us hints into, uh, into interventions. Dario, I just want to say a big, big thank you for coming on. This has really been a very, very interesting conversation. And I'm really sure that people listening have learned a lot. So big, big thank you for coming on. Oh, it's been a pleasure. Thank you so much for the conversation. Hope you enjoyed the episode. Friends, I really need your help. I'm trying to get the podcast out there. So I was wondering if you could help me by leaving a positive rating and a review on your Apple device or the podcast player that you're using, as well as subscribing to the podcast. That really helps getting the show more visible on iTunes and other players. And if you don't know how it's done, then YouTube has a lot of great videos, so you can search there. All right, that's it. Take care. This podcast is for general informational purposes only and does not constitute the practice of medicine, including the giving of medical advice. The content of this podcast is not intended to be a substitute for professional medical advice, diagnosis or treatment.
also to consider that not just about the food, but also the food, you know, where the food is coming from. So if you have your own garden, <laughs> because, you know, I'm, I'm not I'm not just trying to be hippie and, and, and stuff, but I mean, really, like um, industrially, you know, processing food and um, uh, the way the food gets washed. And, uh, you know, a lot of those vitamins that I was talking about come from microbes that are soil microbes. Right. So. So, um, yeah, so having um, your own little garden of diverse herbs would be very, very good, I think. Um, a lot of tubers. We seem to be tuber eating. I mean, if you look at our uh, mouth, the way that we are designed by evolution, right? So if you look at the types of different teeth we have, normally teeth is a very good uh, expression of the diet, right? So because we say, are we carnivores? Are we herbivores? Are we omnivores? Well, we have very limited you know, canines, right? So we are mostly have this huge inc incisor. So we normally process uh, food that lead a lot of scraping off and I think a lot of tubers and we have huge molars. So we break down seeds and stuff. So I think, it, you know, looking at the mouth of a primate and, you know, this is a cultural bias of mine because I have I've studied anthropology a lot, physical anthropology. So I always tend to look at this type of stuff. But uh, yeah, we seem to benefit from probably having like a seed rich diet, uh, vegetable diet, tubers like potatoes. And but, you know, a lot of this stuff, it's, um, uh, of course, uh, farmed uh, and uh, domesticated stuff. Right. So domestication, of course, increased the amount of sugars in food. If you buy tomatoes, even from, you know, um, organic tomatoes in the United States, they they taste like, uh, I don't know, sweets. They are so sugary because they have been uh, they have been uh, selected for that. Right. Um, I, uh, I I don't know really what would have been like a more natural uh, diet. So what types of uh, what types of uh, vegetables or uh, because, you know, we think traditionally, you know, we, we tend to believe that uh, traditional food is good, like our grandmothers or grandparents used to, to, to eat. But also those type of foods are extremely uh, culturally biased in the sense that they are the product of domestication for thousands and thousands of years. So I really wonder what we used to, to eat before. Yeah. Yeah. Sure. No, no. Yeah. yeah. That's right. Exactly. Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, maybe also exploring a little bit. Uh, I mean, when I was in when I when I lived in San Francisco, there were these groups of like urban harvest. I mean, it was a little bit of a hippie hipster kind of a thing. <laughs> of course, of course, right? You can't avoid that in the Bay Area. Uh, but but um, I think knowing a little bit more the environment around you and see what's actually edible and what not will probably lead to a lot of people dying of food intoxication. But also, <laughs> I don't know. Um, but it's, it's an interesting perspective, especially in pandemic times. Uh, you know, but I think that um, uh, there is a lot of uh, there is a lot of uh, potential food out there that uh, we we don't consider normally as food source. Yeah. Well, I I'm, I'm vegetarian, uh, but for different reasons, and uh, I I'm I st I stopped eating I stopped I stopped taking like, you know milk because of personal I, I don't I don't think it's particularly good for my microbiota, um, uh, but for some people it doesn't seem to have any adverse effects, so it's really like individual dependent. I eat a lot of legumes and uh, vegetables and. Uh, I'm not particularly um, disciplined as I would like to be. I, I'm too much swayed by everyday uh, life to take too much care of myself. But, uh, but um, yeah, I I tend to avoid processed food. I mean, I don't eat, um, you know, I try to avoid um, 
cakes or you know extremely high sugar content food that's really bad yeah for your also for my your microbiota yeah that's um yeah so i don't do so much I, I'm, I'm i don't uh you know have a lifestyle um, that is uh too much informed by my understanding of uh uh, of, of this topic. I know that, for example, Justin Sonnenberg, oh, yeah, probably is the other one to, it may be interesting for you, Sonnenberg at Stanford. Uh, Justin Sonnenberg and his wife, uh, they have like this kind of like um, poster family uh, of uh, microbiota um, extreme uh you know, um, adventurers. So they, yeah, they they have a life where they enrich their gut, I guess, with a lot of different. So I I, I don't know. It's a little bit uh, marketing, but I guess uh, maybe also beneficial for them. Yeah. Absolutely. Sure, absolutely. Yeah, I'm I'm active on Twitter, so I, I am definitely going to use that. And uh, also in our institute website, and uh, I already informed our PR uh, officer in our institute about this, so we'll, we'll do that, definitely. Excellent. I'm glad we didn't get to talk about the evolution part, but I guess it's perfectly fine. I mean, the field work thing, but it's it's that would have been taken another hour probably. So, yeah. yeah. Excellent. Yeah, you too. Thank you very much. Bye-bye.